Welcome to our viewers. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Hoda Mahmoudi, uh, the holder of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace at the University of Maryland. We are located in the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences, and I'm very pleased to say that today's lecture is being co-sponsored by the Critical Race Initiative located in the Department of Sociology. Uh, I have to give my thanks as usual to Dr. Kate Seaman, who is the Assistant Director at the Baha'i Chair for her work in uh, arranging and, and successfully uh, planning today's program. And of course, I extend a very warm, warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Dr. Sarai Aharoni, whom I will introduce to you shortly. But first, I must go over some technical uh, <laughs> stuff, as you know. Um, as you know that when you join this virtual uh, meeting, you are muted and your video is off. Because this program is being recorded, we want you to know that by participating in this virtual meeting, you acknowledge your consent to your image, likeness, and voice possibly being recorded. So the Baha'i Chair for World Peace has been actively involved in addressing topics that are central to the pursuit of peace uh, and we pursue a body of tested knowledge that can be used to seek a more just, secure, sustainable, and happy international order. An international order based on shared values and ethical and moral considerations that are the foundation for better societies. The Baha'i Chair promotes his vision for a more peaceful world through five central themes. They are structural racism and the root causes of prejudice, learning about human nature, empowerment of women or the equality of women as a precondition for the pursuit of peace, the challenges of global governance, and of course, the problem of climate change and the environment. Today's lecture falls under the theme of the empowerment of women as a prerequisite to global peace. Since the early 20th century, women have been active in the promotion of peace and the elimination of war. Before the birth of the modern peace movement, individual women had played a key role in social reform and elements of the women's rights and abolitionist movements identified with the peace causes. Women or feminists have always brought a unique perspective to international relations. They have always called attention to the fact that women suffer disproportionately in wartime. They also bring attention to the importance of having women equally represented in foreign affairs and international relations. Women peace activists believe that women's full participation in the political process, and for that matter, in their participation in all aspects of community and society is essential to ending global conflicts. So it's really with great pleasure that I come to our talk today, which is going to provide us with yet another example of women's peace activism in examining the importance of archival preservation of such movements and how these archival uh, preservations can help us understand and keep a uh, history of these important movements. So with, now, with that, it is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Sarai B. Aharoni. Dr. Aharoni is a lecturer in the Gender Studies Program at Ben Gurion University of the Negev in Israel. Previously, she was a visiting professor at the University of Michigan and a postdoctoral fellow at the Hebrew University and Haifa University. Her research interests include women, peace and security, feminist security studies, 
histories of women's policy agency and feminist movements in Israel. Her work has been published in various excellent journals, which I will not read off. Her biographical information is on our website, and I encourage you to take a look at it. But between 2018 and 2020, Dr. Aharoni published original computerized data sets together with Dr. Yael Hassan of women's policy agencies and state feminism in Israel. The range was from 1917, 1970 to 2018. The project documents the trends in the development of various mechanisms for gender equality over time. As a longtime scholar activist, Dr. Aharoni was involved in various civil society initiatives and is one of the founding members of the Haifa Feminist Institute, an independent feminist active archive, library, and research center that seeks to enhance local feminist voices and histories. So today's talk, the title of her talk today is Sharing the Burden, Archival Traces of Israeli Women's Peace Activism. And it's really a pleasure for me to welcome Dr. Aharoni. Thank you so much. Um, and I would like to share um, to share my uh, my presentation. Just a minute. Um, okay. So good afternoon. And uh, first, I would like to thank Professor Huda Mahmoud Huda Mahmoudi and uh, Dr. Kate Seaman from the Baha'i Center um, and Chair of World Peace for inviting me to speak today. I am speaking from Haifa, which is an important Baha'i Center. And this feels like an inspiring connection that is grounding us in a material non-Zoom reality. So today I would like to share some thoughts about um, using local and transnational feminist archives to ask what we as peace scholars or students or activists can learn from attempts to preserve the history and the memory of a civil society movements. Um, and I mean recent civil society movements that have been uh, working for the last few decades. Um, by doing so, I want to follow the historical transformation of women's peace activism in Israel from the late 1970s to the present. But while I wish to explore these changes, I am thinking about the different ways to present the evolution of these groups and the gradual shift. And here are some photographs for you to look at while I'm um, explaining some of my thoughts. Um, so. Um, the gradual shift of these groups from grassroots protest, protest activities in the 1980s that included vigils and demonstrations or petitions towards community organizing that involved also dialogue groups and educational projects in the 1990s during the peace process, the Oslo peace process, and later on to a more professional policy-oriented approach that includes legislation and appeals to the courts or even national planning in the recent uh, two decades. So before we talk about the archives and what, I, what, is, what are these archives that I am uh, researching, I would like to show you how this case study looks from the bird's eye, um, taking a 50 year perspective. And I would like to thank Huda for mentioning the um, data set, our data set, recent data set. And what we are seeing here is a 50 year view on um, the evolution of uh, women's peace groups in Israel uh, per year uh, during the period of 1970 to 2018. <clears throat> so um, this morning I actually worked with the data sets and um, and I came up with this interesting figure and it shows the changes in women's peace activism over time. The total number of groups which were coded in the data set um, as uh, strictly 
peace groups was 27 out of 593, which is roughly 4.5% of the total data set. Um, this means that peace activism is not a dominant field of action for Israeli women to engage in. And it is far less than um, you know, women's groups or policy agencies that work on violence against women, like domestic violence or sexual violence or sexual harassment. It is much less than the number of groups that work on political representation or leadership, labor rights, health, uh, welfare, or education. But still, these groups, these uh, 27 organizations have an interesting presence and they seem to peak in time of violent escalation. So every time there is uh, uh, an escalation of the armed conflict, we see women's new women's groups, peace groups, are forming. And um, we see that um, these were highly dominant or became dominant during the 1990s with the highest number of active organizations around the year 2000. Then in 2000, there were 14 different peace groups, most of them local NGOs, which is quite a lot for a country the size of New Jersey. So um, many of these groups were active for more than five years. This is what I've learned from this comparative kind of bird's eye view. And due to the social profile of their members, which were relatively middle-class, educated, Ashkenazi, namely European origin, and politically involved, they were very visible nationally and internationally. In fact, I would say that from a comparative perspective, the Israeli women's peace movement is probably one of the most creative and vivid social movements in the world. And this very, very rich and vivid movement has tried again and again to respond to one of the most intractable armed conflicts, which also involves a prolonged military occupation and no political settlement in sight. So how do we tell the history and how do we understand the legacy of this movement given the continuation of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the failure, I would say, of these groups to change the militarized political culture that is still highly dominant in Israel. Um, we recently had an election in Israel. This is just an example. And still there is a low, a very low number of women in parliament and especially within the, uh, uh, the, more, dominant, um, the more dominant parties in the center left uh, camp. So usually I say the first step is to listen carefully to the stories of women peace activists. From these stories, we can learn about the specific institutional choices and the overall challenges of organizing and resisting militarism during war. So instead of listening only to success stories, it is really important for those of us who want to understand women's um, response to war to also look and seek cases where women are still strugg struggling to get their voices heard. So before I say, um, I tell you a little bit more about the archives, I want to um, talk a bit about social movements and uh, why women's peace groups are actually part of this field of study, right, um, of social movements. Um, social movements are a little like human beings. They have a DNA, an ideological footprint, and they have life cycles. Here is how I think about life cycles. There is an emergence phase. Sometimes there's a crisis or an event that uh, brings people together to create a movement. And then there is Usually during this time period, there is a, an agenda setting phase where people discuss their values or the types of action that they wanna take. And after a while, if this movement really continues, it will probably go through an institutionalization phase where people start talking seriously about structure, about resources. And then we can also understand what would be the scope or the size of this organization or movement. 
And later on, if the group manages to get institutionalized, it will probably see uh, a different phase. It could be a reform, it could be disintegration or transformation. Sometimes social movements become political parties or um, they morph into something else. Um, and then in the distant um, future, it could happen after 20, 30, or 40 years, these groups will eventually reach their archival phase. And um, the way I see it, um, the core values of a movement are usually discussed very early on during the agenda setting phase. And then um, it takes a lot of time for women to decide, and also men if they are part of these movements, to decide whether they will become an NGO or a local community group or a relief organization or an advocacy team or an educational initiative or a public protest movement. Now, these of course are generalizations and it's important to remember that every armed conflict is unique. Um, every armed conflict generates very specific forms of oppression or discrimination or violence and injustice. And these lead to different opportunities for women to engage in politics. But what I have learned when I am uh, looking in the archival phase is that each of these phases or cycles in a group's life or evolution leaves a footprint. And that this is important because we need to find a way to follow these footprints and to understand and know how women respond to violent armed conflict, how they cope with the challenges over time and what happens when they succeed or fail. So through the story of the creation of the feminist peace archives and the various documents and material objects that have been deposited and rescued over time, I want to address broader concepts of empowerment, success, and failure. And, and I, I decided to put this photograph of Pola, who is a volunteer in the Haifa Feminist um, Archive. And she, um, this picture was taken in the summer of 2020 while she was working on a rescued archive of the recently closed Coalition of Women for Peace, which I will shortly discuss later on. So this is what we call archiving as a form of activism. Um, the, um, from now onwards, I am going to present some initial findings from a study that I am conducting with two colleagues, Dr. Chedva Eyal and Dr. Ruth Pressel. This study focuses on what we call archiving as activism in Israel. It is based on a comparative analysis of two types of local archives. We identify the first uh, group of archives as the feminist peace archives, which are supposed, which are supposed to include thousands of published and unpublished documents and other organizational materials, like visuals, objects, posters, audio tapes, and other things which were produced by approximately 18 different local women's peace organizations um, that we chose from the broader uh, list of, of groups that I mentioned previously. Um, many of these groups no longer exist and this project was meant to save whatever could be saved and to better understand the various meanings that women peace activists assign to these archival materials and to the possibility of preserving their political histories. So while we were able to locate some of these organizational legacies in a feminist community archive in Haifa, most of these um, private archives or organizational archives were actually lost or scattered among various homes and in places in Israel and abroad. And at least this was the case prior to March, 2020 when Israel was shut down due to the COVID pandemic. The second uh, group of archives um, that we are documenting deals with um, sexual violence. This is not supposed to be, these are not supposed to be peace archives. Um, 
And um, these include um, a survey of all the Israeli rape crisis centers, registries, and um, archives. In Israel, there are 11 uh, rape crisis centers that were established in different parts of the country since 1977. While rape crisis centers are more organized NGOs than peace movements, their archives, which contain also thousands of unsorted documents from the late 1970s to the present have not been digitized yet or previously researched, and they are relatively inaccessible to the public. Um, a part of um, uh, engaging in an actual survey of 22 different organizational archives, and this means hundreds of hours of actually going through material materials, we conducted um, 59 interviews with local activists and also with professional archivists to examine the motivations and the perceptions and the engagements with women's history. And also with what we call the politics of archival memory. So um, the study involved also um, an ethnography and public activities. As you can see here, um, this is this picture was taken. This is me here sitting in the um, Haifa Feminist Archives uh, in an event that was called Opening the Peace Collection in October 2020. This was part of the um, um, national events that were uh, designed to commemorate or to celebrate the 20 years, tw the end of 20th anniversary of uh, UN Security Council 1325 that deals explicitly with um, women, peace, and security. And so um, this event was meant to open to the public the Women's Peace Archives, and we were able to um, get people to come for small tours because of the pandemic and to open boxes and actually look in the documents. And if you come to Israel, you are very much invited to visit the archive, which is a fascinating place. Um, so this is also part of the research. This was documented, but what we actually did was um, to, we literally came into offices and homes and requested women to open their closets, to open their drawers, to open their cabinets, and to let us see what's inside. And then we sit and we talk to them and we ask them questions like, what do you think should be done with this? And why are these things important? And while we are doing this, we actually discovered that some women have saved a lot of memories. And these include um, documents, printed documents, handwritten documents, but also objects like, you know, as you can see on the left, pins or small, um, small um, uh, memorabilia, that they have actually kept for years from various activities they participated in. Um, here is a citation from one of the conversations with Sarah, who is a woman in her late 60s. She's a well-known feminist and peace activist. And we talked about some boxes um, with stuff from the women's organizations she headed in the 1990s that actually reached the feminist archives in Haifa. So here is what she said. I don't think that we ever called it an archive. We did not intend to create an archive. I always wanted to maintain a sense of historical consciousness. I was aware of that on a personal level. There were lots of printed flyers in each project had different flyers. There were catalogs of exhibitions, committees, protocols, board meetings, protocols, all were organized in binders. That's how it was. But now what has remained, I have to check. I need to travel to the feminist archive to open the boxes. It is very important for me. When I thought that this whole history was lost, I felt terrible grief. Now, our preliminary findings suggest that the amount of historical records which are stored 
um, in both of the archives that we are surveying um, is enormous and much more than what we initially expected. And yet a lot of the things have been lost. Um, most of the documents and objects we found are from the early 1980s to 2005. We noticed that after 2005, most NGOs have moved to digital storage, which made their archives more messy and much more difficult to trace or document. The main types of physical archival materials uh, that we found included um, internal organizational records, official correspondences, publications, media paper clips, and private records. Um, whenever we had a chance to visit an elderly woman's home, a basement, um, or a back room in an NGO office, we also felt excitement. Um, many of the documents we found were from transnational movements. Um, we, we understood that we had to keep our eyes and ears open to receive these unexpected gifts and presents that only archives can deliver. Jacques Derrida called this archive fever. Sometimes, this is what we've learned, archives keep things that might seem awkward or unnecessary. I came to notice that Israeli feminist archives, which are not state archives and they have no official obligation to follow professional archival rules are in fact much more international than originally suspected. Throughout the years, women, both as peace activists and as volunteers and workers in the Rape Crisis Center, went to international meetings or donated their libraries and they left behind a rare glimpse into how transnational ties were created before the age of the internet. Here's an example, one day in the feminist archive, I stumbled upon an original copy of an official report by the government of Indonesia to the CEDAW convention, which is um, the CEDAW is um, the convention for the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. It was signed in 1979 and this report is from 1981. Take, for example, these publications of a Japanese anti-militarist group, which I found in the Rape Crisis Center in Tel Aviv. These uh, journals are in Japanese, and they were just sitting in a box for decades. Clearly, they, there are several questions that these findings bring to mind. For example, how did these things reach Haifa and Tel Aviv? And why were they kept for decades? And who do these materials belong to? I am wondering whether I should tell someone. Maybe these are rare treasures that carry an important meaning to someone else. Maybe women from Indonesia need this or women in Japan are looking for this, right? I mean, um, maybe feminists in other places might find valuable, a valuable, um, um, meaning to these objects that were forgotten in Israel. But then I realized that these are futile engagements because one cannot downplay the fact that these artifacts arrived somehow in Israel and that they say something about contacts between women and uh, maybe feminist activists from different parts of the world in the late 20th century. As I am working my way through the archives, I understand that local feminist peace activism is embedded in a global story of women's growing political presence. Um, we also found, and here I'm moving um, a little bit further, that the storage conditions of all the different types of archives were very bad. So um, these in fact are endangered archives and they may be lost. Although feminist activists and NGO workers were deeply and genuinely concerned with various aspects of preservation, um, they were also, um, it is, we also heard that it is getting very hard for them 
to do so. Scarce financial resources, lack of physical space, and uneven methods of archiving, um, and also conflicts over ownership appeared as major obstacles for preservation. And as I mentioned before, our study was abruptly interrupted by the pandemic. The last interview that reflects the pre-COVID phase occurred on March 9th, 2020, and it was interview number 27. Since then, we were able to conduct 32 more interviews. 18 of them were through the internet. We discovered that many elderly women who were politically active in Israeli feminist and peace movements in the 1970s and 1990s were actually cleaning their homes during the pandemic. Namely, they were throwing away personal items that were, that we thought of of as collective archives. Um, here is a citation um, from an interview with Daphna, uh, now a woman in her mid fifties. And she was a coordinator of a well-known Israeli Palestinian women's peace organization. When we arrived in her home at the end of May, um, 2020, there was almost nothing left. And here is a citation from the interview. She says, I threw out most of what was here. Listen, it was just so long ago and I am a different, I'm in a different story. I left the peace organization in 1997 and I have done so many things since. There was also this issue of physical space. After we spoke on the phone, I searched for things and I saw that some of these folders that I kept with things that were related to the organization are now full of old children's school cards and grandchildren's photographs. And then I took out some photo albums after you called. I'll search for something. And then she says, we were so much younger. That was nice to see, but the truth is that is also depressing because why do we need archives to learn from history, right? I see that even you who have seen the archives understand that there is no real way to understand what happened. It is so fragmented and mostly depressing because we are in a much worse situation today. This is the hardest thing. <clears throat> now this citation really tells us that archives are sometimes very painful places, which is probably why women don't always keep, keep them uh, or preserve them for the future. The pandemic uh, didn't affect only private archives. <clears throat> Some of the existing organizations we contacted were struggling to survive the looming financial crisis. The Rape Crisis Center Union, for example, decided to move to a smaller office, uh, which was provided by the Tel Aviv municipality. The new place was much smaller and so they had to decide what to throw out. Last June, we already had enough knowledge about feminist archives and so we were able to help them decide um, what to do, what to keep, what not to keep. And this was an optimistic moment to see how the dry academic curiosity suddenly became so helpful. But the less optimistic event was the unexpected collapse of a prominent feminist peace group called the Coalition of Women for Peace. The coalition was established in 2000 and the group has, was becoming increasingly targeted by the Israeli government due to its outspoken campaign against the occupation and its support of BDS. As the pandemic exasperated um, the existing financial problems of the organization, they decided to shut down and clear out the offices in a week's notice. Determined to keep the organizational archive, me and a group of uh, other women drove around the country to save the coalition's archives. Hana Safwan from the feminist uh, archive and the actually mastermind uh, of this whole project wrote me an email saying, it was very sad. It was like removing a dead corpse and bringing it to a respected burial. 
Um, among the things that I found was a pile of posters from an international women in black conference that was held in Jerusalem in 2005. And I was really touched by this. I recognized the poster because I participate in, participated in that conference as a very young mother. My son was maybe one year old. I was young. So I took one of the posters from the pile and I hanged it over my kitchen table. Now, the last story that I want to share from this uh, study is about choice. In July, after uh, about a month before the second lockdown, before Israel entered the second lockdown, we traveled to see the archives of a well-known um, organization. It was a multi-purpose, it is a multi-purpose organization that operated uh, various services for women, um, including a hotline, a shelter, and their archive is a very unique one. When we arrived to their beautiful offices, we were welcomed by the manager um, with a big smile. She was happy to see us after the pandemic seclusion. As we walked, as she walked us through the different rooms, I noticed that she was pointing proudly to various spaces saying, look, this was full of clutter, or we finally had an opportunity to clean and organize these cabinets. And then to our shock, she told us that when the lockdown started and all the workers were home, they bought a shredder. It cost only a thousand um, and seven hundred shekels. The office manager was the only person who came to the office. She sat for weeks and shredded thousands of documents. These were calls to the hotlines, to the shelter, and were approximately 8,000 individual stories uh, and women's testimonials from 1992 to 2012. All of them were gone. When I heard this, I, of course, I almost fainted, <laughs> but the manager in her calm voice explained that this was a huge relief, relief. And this is what she said. We just don't have space. Every time you come to the office, there are many, many, many things that you just don't use. It's just filled with dust. So you keep thinking about this all the time thinking about these binders that you will never use and it's their stuff. And here she talks about victims that were, were actually calling for with testimonies, right? So do we need to keep and maintain this until when? What if there will, there will be a break-in? What will happen? She, the victim should decide if the world should know or not. It's not for me to decide, it is her story. Me, I am a feminist. And as a feminist, I have to make reports like statistical reports. But all this documentation, well, it raises the question, um, do I as a feminist have a right to use these testimonials or how should I find all the ways to protect that woman from harm? I would like to conclude this journey with a question mark. Um, and um, the question is basically, who gets to tell the histories of women in war and peace? Who gets to, <clears throat> to who gets access into these archives? What are the conditions for preservation of these stories? Will we ever have time <clears throat> to actually go back and hear and listen to what these women have learned over time. I would like to um, <clears throat> suggest that archiving as a form of activism could be an interesting meeting point between the present, the past, and the future. Opening a box and looking at these objects that were created in the past enables or can enable us in the present to think together about the future. So 
archiving is actually a way to think about feminist time in, in a very different way. It is not a linear time. It is not a story of success. It is rather a polytemporal um, reality where women simultaneously succeed and fail. So I think I will end here and open for questions and thoughts from the audience. Thank you so much, Dr. Aharoni. What an interesting presentation and uh, somewhat heartbreaking at times to think that these uh, archives <clears throat> are being thrown away or shredded because of lack of space uh, and how important it is for all of us to think about uh, ways that we in our own lives can preserve things and get them to the right place so that they can be preserved in, in some form in some archives. Um, I would now like to open the uh, session to questions and answers. And you can see that there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we encourage you to please go there and uh, pose your questions. Um, meanwhile, I want to uh, ask the first question, if I may. Um, in, in general, would you say that in Israel, the number of uh, women's uh, peace activist groups, uh, is it on a, on a decline or does it vary depending on the political climate? So um, overall, um, we are seeing, okay, so in the last decade, we've seen only one new women's peace group, um, which is called Women Wage Peace. It was formed in 20, 2014 after the war in Gaza. And um, it's a very interesting group that attempts to create a mass movement. And um, so uh, on the one hand, this group is very visible, but it is, it is only one group. And when we compared it to previous decades, we actually found that in the 80s and 90s, and also in the first decade of the 2000s, there were approximately somewhere between seven to nine new women's peace groups. So in the last decade, we're actually seeing a decline in the number of new women's peace groups. Um, and we're trying to explain this in different ways. Another thing that we've seen um, is um, the fact that we, we're seeing a generational change. Younger women are entering the feminist movement, the women's movement. And we think that maybe these women will actually become more active in peace politics in the next decade. So we're going to see this kind of generational move uh, um, from, by feminist activists to political, more political forms of activism. And, but this is only my kind of hunch. Actually, that's encouraging to hear that younger generation of women are getting more active in the peace movement. Yes, and this is also this is one of the reasons why we need archives, right? Because um, because inventing everything again and again is very very tiring, right? <laughs> why, why do you? If I may, just before I go to the question that that someone has asked, uh, why do you think all of a sudden the younger generation has become interested? Any any ideas? Well, I think um, um, it's. We're, what, what, I, what I understand is that sometimes uh, peace politics is more difficult and complicated than feminist politics. So many women, younger women, when they, when they actually go out and decide that they are part of you know, a feminist movement, they decide to protest against sexual violence or rape or you know, the Me Too, and if they already go out and they already become political, then they make, that is a first step. And after that, joining some kind of a more politicized movement like an anti-militarist movement or peace movement is a little easier than going directly into peace. And because we're seeing all over the world, a new generation of um, feminist activism in the last decade, then it actually makes sense that many of these young women will become more active in other types of activism 
it could be environmental issues, it could be peace issues, it could be social justice. Um, so I think feminism is, is a very good starting point for political activity, and then it can actually broaden into other realms. Um, and I always um, um, tell my students, right, that this is just a first step. <laughs> There's always more to do. Thank you. We have a question. Have you been able to get the word out more broadly that you are looking for documentation and stories? Are there any attempts to get oral histories? Well, um, this is an interesting question because we, we, we have a lot of connections um, and we were able to talk to, uh, to, to get the word out. Um, but there is a difference between oral, oral history research and archival research. And when you, when you do oral history projects, you create an archive. But what we were doing, we are trying to find existing archives and save them. And the difference is that when you, when you, you find an archive, it could be just a you know, a few binders, right? Or uh, a, a box. You don't know what future generations will need, right? So you take the box as it is and you put it in the archive. You can never know who will be looking or what will future generations want to know, right? So it's, it's not about selecting or actually going through the things. It's more about preserving, keeping, or talking about whatever we find um, as a way to imagine the past and the future. Thank you. Uh, next question. Thank <clears throat> you for a truly fascinating presentation. Are there any known trusted individuals or organizations who might be commissioned to gather documents, conduct interviews, and archive these very important historical artifacts. No. <laughs> well, I, I, can you can you uh, read the names of the people who are asking? Right. Yes, this the first one was from Ann Holmes. I forgot, and the second one is from Neda Moayad. Okay. Um, the question, the answer is no, and the reason I think is political. I think that um, there is a paradox that women's peace activism becomes important or valuable when there is a success story. So if you go to Northern Ireland or you go to Liberia, you will probably find some kind of a collective attempt to, um, you know, to, to, to preserve these histories. But in Israel-Palestine, where you have an active conflict and these movements are not seen as mainstream in terms of, you know, Israeli politics, then there is no community, communal sense of this is important. And, and I think that there is a, a political aspect to preserving um, political archives of groups that are actually not part of the, you know, the um, hegemonic story, especially when there is an armed, an active armed, conf armed conflict. That's really an important point, actually, that you point out, because this, we don't often think about those uh, external factors that can influence this whole process. The next question is from Naama Barak. What are your thoughts about digital archiving? I was thinking about this regarding the shredded testimonies. Um, so, as I said, digital, the digital phase, which is post 2005 in our case study, the digital phase is much, is much more messy than the previous print phase. The print phase <clears throat> is actually easy to find. When you, when you have it, when you get it, you can touch it, you can open, you can actually see what's there. Digital phase, <clears throat> is scattered and many women have, you know, they've changed computers and they don't have access and then you can't re read the format. And you really have to have these very, very well-organized people who actually save everything and know where to find things. 
uh, to get a good digital archive. So this is one thing. And, um, and the second thing is um, that it's very hard to search in these archives. And you really, you have to come with this, these keywords. You have to know what you're looking for. There's no room for this unexpected findings. Um, I think maybe less than, but digitization is very pricey and it takes a lot of time. And um, it's just in terms of, of the resources needed to scan. And also there's this question of privacy, which I didn't address here, but we are also very preoccupied with questions of privacy. So for example, the Haifa Feminist Archive, they scanned the, um, they scanned, uh, 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 the lesbian archive, which predates, which actually goes back to the 1970s but these scanned documents are not accessible because some of them include personal information, right? So maybe there was a woman who was out in the 1980s, but nobody knows that she was part of this lesbian group. And right, maybe her grandchildren will see it if it's on the internet, whatever. So there is this issue of privacy that comes with um, the digital uh, kind of the digital, the digital fever for actually digitizing things and making them accessible, that's also part of it. Yeah, I think the ethical questions are quite, uh, you know, are, are immense and, and have to be really considered, as you say. Next question is from Tiffany Betts Razavi. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. What is the most striking thing you have learned <clears throat> from the story of the empowerment of women? from your study of archival materials? That's a good question. Well, I think um, it's hard for me to uh, point to a specific story, but there is an effect, there is an, an, uh, an effect, there is a, this effect of going through these materials that stays with me for a long time. And when I open boxes and I, and, I, and I hold the papers, what I get is a sense of like, and these, we're talking about thousands of documents, like tens of thousands of documents. I get a sense of, wow, these women, they actually invested like days and years of their lives, like doing voluntary work for a cause they believed in. And all, when we look at photographs, we always see women um, either very angry when they're protesting in the streets or very happy at, when they are sitting together and eating or dancing. So there is the sense of something that remains from these, these physical moments that were, frozen in time. So I think there is not one, one thing that I, I, I have this, this sense of, wow, these things really happened. Interesting, very interesting. From Feven Hurui, if, you'd ex if you had experiences with women who refused to share their documents, <laughs> what were the reasons for refusal? Also, are there methods you employ to try and change their minds? This is a good question. One of the um, organizations that we are um, documenting is, uh, is an organization that does not want to be remembered. Mm. And it's a group of women who have been engaging in a very radical form of politics, which I actually can't talk about. <laughs> and they, just don't want to, you know, they don't want to be interviewed and they don't want to share their histories. And um, they say, we were doing whatever we were doing for the sake of justice. We were doing it for peace. We were doing it because it was the right thing to do. We did not do this to be remembered. And this is a very big dilemma, right? Because women in history have always erased their footprints, right? We don't know anything about women's histories because we don't have access. And so I think 
that we need to find a way to tell these stories without, um, with, to t we, we need to find a way to tell these stories with respect to um, the cause or the perspective or the ethics of these specific groups and the context of their lives. And yeah, it's, it's a, this is a, 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 a huge dilemma. Everybody who deals with archival work, um, especially with recent materials, um, has to kind of ask themselves about, okay, what could be saved and how, yeah. You had mentioned, uh, if I understood correctly, that um, the number of um, women's peace movements currently has declined, is that right, in recent years? Did I understand that correctly? Um, is that simply because of the political picture or what, what do you attribute that to? Um, yeah, so one of the reasons is the, I think what we call the, um, the political opportunity structure or the, the actual ability of um, um, the, the, I guess Israel is, is, is um, experiencing a shrinking uh, public sphere and especially in terms of democracy. And um, we're seeing that the, that peace is, you know, peace as a word is, is, not, is not a legitimate word in terms of Israeli society. And so it is hard for women who are already marginalized as women in terms of their political presence and power and resources, it is hard for them to engage with what we call taboo issues, like the occupation is a taboo or peace as a taboo. It is very hard for women to do that. So um, that could be one explanation. And um, um, and yes, the the the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is is in a in a deadlock, and there is um, and and these are hard times for peace activists. Thank you, thank you for answering that question and doing it in such a sensitive manner. I appreciate it. Next question is from Martha Riley. Thank you for this important and much needed learning opportunity. I'm researching the role of women of faith in peace building right now and would love to know what are some of the ways the work of these women has contributed to vital interfaith dialogue. This is a, an interesting question. One thing we can learn from um, community archives is um, we can learn about the changes and the trends um, of peace activism. For example, in the 80s and the 90s, we could say, I can say that mu much of women's peace activism in Israel and Palestine was very secular. These were very secular women that were talking about justice or peace as justice or peace as self-determination or peace as um, um, related to democracy. And as time goes by, we see that as the conflict becomes more religious for, for different reasons, women's responses are also more religious. So we actually see more religious women entering the field of peace activism, um, inter, especially in, of course, interfaith dialogue um, and, but also, um, as, as part of movements. So for example, Women Wage Peace, which I was uh, mentioning, which I mentioned before, which is the, the most recent women's peace uh, group in Israel, actually talks a lot about faith. And although many women are secular, but they also have religious women and they actually want to speak to religious women, Muslim and um, Jewish especially, and so they talk about um, spirituality, about God, about um, um, shared histories, and they also uh, do make, they, they actually organize events that have some kind of uh, religious meanings. For example, in Casa del Yehud near Jericho, they had this very big gathering a few years back, which 
was secular, but not secular. It was actually embedded with historical religious imaginations. And these were uh, women, Palestinian and um, Israeli, Jewish, Arab, Muslim, uh, that were coming together in a, in a holy place. So I think that religious um, imaginations and also ceremonies are becoming more central in the region. And this actually makes me think about the changes like over time uh, in, in, in women's peace activism that was very secular and now is becoming more religious. Very good, thank you. Um, the, the other uh, question I was going to raise is, um, you know, you have done a lot of work with uh, women and peace and security. Uh, overall, could you, I mean, I would love to hear your perspective on what you have learned over the years as you've done this so, such important research. Um, so, first of all, I think that, um, okay, so I come from feminist international relations and there is a lot of work, there, there's a lot of work on policy and international norms and how um, the international community and especially the UN uh, can actually um, intervene or help or create a set of norms that would actually encourage countries and states to um, advance women's rights and the protection of women and the involvement of women in peace negotiations, etc. And I think that this has been very important. But at the same time, what I've learned is that um, I've learned that um, political elites, and especially men who, who have power, um, are the key for change. So when we have political elites that are willing to step back and are willing to um, uh, add and give women a place, and I'm not talking about women from the political elites, but women from all walks of society. So when we have um, men negotiators, for example, or political leaders that understand that they have to give a place for women, then the change happens. So I think this is something that's very frustrating for me because you know I really, um, I, I really think that women have to demand this, but it's again and again, we see that there has to be political will for women to become part of the process. Thank you. Um, I have a question from uh, Kate Seaman. With the groups who don't want to share their archives, is there a way to save these and their contributions to be shared later? Um, yes, I actually think that um, one of the things that we can do is um, collect, is just collect documents uh, from elderly, from the from older generations or organizations that have you know closed or had to close or had to, to you know clear their offices, and um, without, and of course keeping them with agreement, right? Some kind of an agreement that this is going to be safe. Um, so there is, I think we have, there is a, something that is like a contract. How do younger generations, what, what kind of contract uh, can be done with the older generations um, in which younger people um, actually say, okay, we will keep this. <laughs> and we will safeguard it, right? Yeah, no, that's really, that's a very helpful uh, comment for all of us to keep in mind. Uh, the next question, what connections are there between current women's groups in Israel and other groups internationally? How do these connections benefit these groups? This is also from Kate. Um, this is a good question. Um, so the truth is, that um, 
the Israeli feminist movement in general, and also peace groups, do not have a lot of international, um, they don't have much of international, too, too much international um, uh, connections. And this has to do, this is related to, um, I think, I think to a certain extent to um, the way the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is being perceived, and especially due to um, the, the BDS kind of, the BDS, I think the impact of the BDS, which, which basically um, limited certain types of uh, cooperation, especially within progressive circles. So, um, is, so I, I sometimes, this is just, I, I really, I'm trying to be very kind of, um, so I sometimes use the image of, of like an, an of evolutionary, you know, sometimes we have these evolutionary um, caves or places where a certain type of a frog will develop, which does not have contacts with other species, and then it becomes a very strange species, right? So I think of Israeli feminism as a type of a strange species because Israeli, Israel has a huge feminist movement with a lot of young women and doing lots of things, but because the uh, Israel's kind of political situation, these women don't have like contacts, regular contacts with radical or other feminists around the world. And so they, they develop their own type of feminism, which is fascinating. Like I find it wonderful in a way, but at the same time, uh, those of us who believe in transnational kind of solidarity or ties between women and know the, knowing this, that this is so important for women, um, I think that um, I really hope that, um, you know, future generations will be able to kind of recreate um, these solidarities. And, and of course, we, if there is a peaceful solution to the conflict, it will be much easier, right? So things are connected. Yes, thank you. Uh, from Sarah Rissanen, are there connections between different generations of women's groups? Uh, are these actively fostered? Uh, well, not much. There, there aren't, I don't think there are a lot of um, intergenerational connections, although the archive as a project is actually an intergenerational project. So archiving is, is a way to create connections. It is, and, and I'm always um, fascinated when my students, um, when I bring things to class and students just touch the papers and they say, wow, like this is real. And then they start asking questions, real questions about, wait, how did they do this? And how did they organize? And how did they print these these you know these fanzines or how did they how did they do this and so and so I think that archives have can have this effect this intergenerational effect of curiosity so so I think that that um, these projects are actually intergenerational projects. Thank you, uh, from Tiffany Betts Razavi. Based on your comment a few moments ago about opening up possibilities for the greater participation of women in politics, what do your archival studies show about the involvement of men in feminist activism in Israel? So one interesting thing is, I think maybe I have it here. No, whatever. Uh, one interesting thing that uh, um, we found is that you know, looking back uh, in the in the '70s and '80s, uh, we we really we really see that the left or the peace camp in Israel, which was really dominated by men, um, that we actually can see that they did not speak about women. <laughs> they did not speak about women, and so it was not this story that we heard from the elderly women. It is real. I was, we were, we, we could actually see that the way uh, men in the peace movement disregarded women's women. And we could, we, when you, when you open the um, protocols, you see that 
um, you know, women write the protocols and men speak. Like these things that you actually can see in the archive. And today we know that this is discrimination and we know that this is about power. But the archive also keep these memories. And so, um, and, and then, and I think it's interesting to see this change, like gradually change. And um, one of the reasons that maybe we don't have women's peace movements is because today some of the new movements that are um, you know, organized by young women, women and men are actually like intersectional. So the, they have this intersectional politics. So men are committed to a certain way and, you know, and men and women and LGBT and others they find ways to engage differently with politics. And maybe that is also a reason that we have less, um, you know, women's uh, peace groups. Thank you. David Hansen asks, when you encounter by coincidence <coughs> while working with a women's defense NGO, a young adult with vulnerable legal status, and you realize that you worked with their mother decades earlier, how do you thread the needle of what, of what to share and what to protect? It seems similar to the case of adopted children and separated birth mothers. Wow, that's a hard question. That is a hard question. It's a very good question. So in other words, um, the earlier decades and their mother, you know, uh, the work with their mother, uh, decades earlier, and how do you thread the needle of what sh what to share and what to protect? In, yeah. yeah, well, um, we, 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 we did interviews with the professional archivists, and we asked them these questions, some of these like, technical questions, like, what do you think uh, should be open? Should everything be open? What should be closed? What should people... So... Um, so there is um, some, we have some guidelines. We, can have, we have some recommendations actually. And we think that um, uh, private information that, that is about, like, about, about private lives, people's private lives, including sexuality, including, including violence, including legal status, um, should be protected um, for a long time. And also um, archives, that are deposited with trusted people, organizations should have some kind of guidelines to the purpose. Um, and what, what should be the purpose of people coming and looking at the archives? Should it be for research? Um, is it open for journalists, for the wider public? And what parts of each archive are open? So I think that yes, when we start thinking seriously about preservation, we have to talk about these things and we have to, you know, be responsible to, um, yeah, people's privacy. Some documents could be anonymized. So there is a possibility of anonymization. So that would be erasing, really erasing names or, um, and yeah, so some things, um, things could be done. Thank you so much. I think uh, that is the end of our questions. Uh, again, Dr. Aharoni, I'd like to thank you for a most interesting presentation. There is so much that you have given us to think about. Uh, the, the most important part that I take away is that everyone who is involved in some kind of important activity should really keep their archives and find a way to give it to a place which can take care of the materials but also the importance of understanding uh, the women's peace movement in Israel uh, and the fact that you are actually um, making sure that you have, you preserve as much of this information as possible, but also for your insights into not only what the younger generation can do in this regard, but, but also what we are experiencing currently in the global political picture in relation to women's maybe lack of participation in that political agenda in relation to how to bring more peace to this very troubled world. So you've really given us a lot of important information and I thank you so much
for your excellent presentation and for your joining us today. Thank you. And, and I'd like to, um, uh, is there anything else you'd like to say, Dr. Aharoni? Well, I would like to thank you for uh, this invitation. Again, I am sorry that um, I could not be with you um, at the university. These are hard times, but I can say from Israel that um, um, I think the vaccinations are working. And so I really hope that many of us, um, not only in the um, Northern um, part of the globe, but also in other parts that many of us will be able to return to a more, um, to a more normal life and to meet each other again. <laughs> And I hope that when you do travel our way, uh, perhaps we can set up another occasion where you could give another talk on aspects of women, peace, and security. So thank you again. And before we end this uh, session, I'd like to remind our audience uh, about our next event, um, which is uh, scheduled for April 13, and you see the slide on your screen. Uh, we are featuring Professor Janelle Wong from uh, the University of Maryland. She's Professor of Asian American Studies. Uh, the topic of her uh, talk, actually it will be moderated, uh, question and answers, um, anti-Asian violence in context, historical roots and contemporary connections. Uh, as you can see, this is a co-sponsored event with um, not only Critical Race Initiative, but African American Studies Department and the Asian American Studies Program, and of course, in the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences. Um, I do hope you will join us because uh, I know that this uh, issue of um, uh, violence, uh, Asian American violence is of concern to all of us. And uh, I, I think this will be a very important program for us to join. So we invite you to join us then, to follow us on our website, on our social media, where we list all of our upcoming events. My thanks again to Dr. Aharoni and goodbye to our viewers. Thank you.